Okay, so here we are going to try to find all the possible binary operations on a set of size 2. Okay, binary operation means it's a map from where to where? No, S is the set, so yeah. Oh, S times S cross S to S. Okay. Okay, any function from S cross S to S. And it's closed. That's part of what it means to be binary operation. Okay. So we first let let tell you think how would you describe a binary op an explicit binary operation? How do you specify it? What would we need to do to specify the binary operation? You want to make a table of some sort. It's called the multiplication table. Do you think know what you know what a multiplication table should look like? Like 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 what kind of like one, two, three, four. No, it's a multiplication table for the for this operation on this set. There will be a row of the elements of the set. So and the column of the elements of the set. And how will you fill in the entries? You'll say row element the row element times the column element. You could do column element times row element, you can decide which way to do it. But you fix a convention and then you just say we are going to have this table. Okay, so we'll use multiplication tables. Okay, the multiplication table completely describes the binary operation, right? If you know the multiplication table, then you know what the binary operation is. And if you know what the binary operation is, then you know what the multiplication table is, right? Yeah. So this describes the binary operation precisely. Okay. Now, since your set has, and this is true for any set, right? It's not just for a set of size 2. At least when you're working with finite sets, you can actually write down the full table. Okay, so our table, the generic table will have Okay, and let's say you do row times column. So this will be A star A. I mean, act, the actual multiplication table will have an actual element, which could be either A or B. I'm just writing out what what they should mean. Okay? Right? So, for, for the actual choice of the operation, you'll fill in what these four things are. Okay. Got it? So, now, how many possible multiplication tables are there? Which means, how many possible magma structures? Magma just means a set with a binary operation. So, how many possible binary operations can you have on a set with two elements? Well, for each of these four cells, how many choices do you have for each one? For each cell? Yeah. You could pick either element, right? You could pick A or B. So, how many choices do you have? Two. Two. And how many cells are there? One. So, what's the total number of choices? Eight. How do you get eight? Two times four. Why two times four? Sixteen. I don't mean anything. What do you mean? <laughs> well, so think about so. So for the first one, you have two choices. For this one, again, you have two choices. For this, you have two. For this, you have two. Right? Oh, that is sixteen. Sixteen. So it's two to the four. So you have two to the four equals sixteen possible magmas. Uh, now, if in general, if you have a set of size n, what would it be? Size n? Yeah. Like instead of 2, you had n elements. What is the number of possible multiplication? So this is the number of possible multiplication tables. So what is it for n? It will be... Well, how did we get the 2? The 2 was just n. Uh, what n were the 4? n to the n squared. The 4 was 2 squared, right? So you get n to the n squared. That's a lot of things, right? Yeah. So, so with 3, it's already uh, 3 to the 9, which mm -hmm. is, yes, what is it? It's 19,683. Okay. Uh, pro I hope I did that. Right. But <laughs> it's about that big. Okay. So that's a lot. And with 4, you have 4 to the 16, which I cannot go in my head. Okay. 
so it's a it grows pretty quickly now uh actually they're not all different some of them actually look the same as each other if you sort of change the labels of an remember you have you can actually switch the labels an right mm -hmm. i mean these are just labels for the elements if you switch the labels so of these 16 they're not all different in like a in the, there, there are some which are equivalent to each other in some sense we haven't defined what that notion of equivalence is yet though what we'll do right now will give us some hints so that when we see that later it, it's clear okay but for now let's just uh, try to write down that, write them down write down all 16 of them maybe and uh, figure out okay instead of writing down all 16 right now let's try to write down the ones which are restricted in some sense or uh, before we go that can you tell me what what these various conditions mean in terms of the multiplication table so what would it mean to say that the binary operation is commutative what does commutativity mean in terms of the multiplication table i will reduce 16 to 8 that's true but what does like pictorially if i give you a multiplication table how do you figure out whether it's commutative uh see where it is symmetric yes and 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 obviously, I'm, I'm choosing the convention that the row labels and column labels are in the same order. In that case, what you said is exactly that. So, commutative, if and only if the multiplication table is symmetric. And the number of commutative operations is for a given, for a general n, what will it be? Like like you had n to the n square. What 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 will it be? The number of commutative operations. Divided by two. Well, not just divided by two. You yeah, you'll actually have you'll have n oh, choices oh, oh, for the diagonal, have, and you'll have n times have n minus one over two. So it's a little bit of combinatorics, but minus n is the whole thing minus n divided by two. No, it's actually n to the n times n plus one over two. So what's happening is that the diagonal ones you still can choose any way you want, right? Because those are the squares. The off diagonal ones, you you have to do choose only half of them. Okay. So it's n. The exponent is n plus half of n times n minus one, right? So this actually this is we get as n plus half of n times n minus. Oh, so half of n square minus n. So n the diagonal ones and half of the remaining ones. Okay, that's what this got. Okay, so that's what commutativity means, and in our case, in our case, we get, as you said, it's two to the three, which is eight. So in our case, half of them are half of the multiplication tables you write are commutative, but in general, it's it's a very small fraction because this number is much smaller than this in general, right? It's about the square root of that. Okay, uh, what about uh, associativity? Do you see how associativity could be checked from the multiplication table? I don't, right? It's it's very really hard to check associativity because associativity involves doing the operation another time, right? So you have to actually like go here, then take the row for that, and then go again, right? You need to do multiple lookups. So it's not something you can check very easily pictorial, right? So associativity is hard. But neutral elements are again easy. So left neutral. So if I say, for instance, a particular element is left neutral, what would that mean? So left neutral, I'll remind you, means that that thing times anything else is that other thing, right? Yeah. So repeated rows. Uh, left neutral would mean. Well, so so a left neutral means a star a is a, and a star b is b. So. So left neutral means that the row is actually a repetition of the of the row which describes the headings of the columns, right? So the row for that element is equal to the row for the column headers. And similarly, you can write right neutral. It'll be the column for that element equals the column for the row headers. Hmm? Yeah. And uh, neutral would mean both the conditions. Neutral meaning identity element would mean it's 
the row is a repeat of the header row and the column is a repeat of the header column right yeah okay good uh so we have we have some sense of what similarly right neutral and two sided neutral neutral is just another word for identity element if you're more comfortable with that okay good so now suppose i say you have a binary operation it's commutative Oh, let's let's do something instead of commutative. Okay, suppose you have a binary operation and it has a neutral element. Okay, so let's say A is neutral. What are the possibilities? So let's say A is neutral. That means it's two-sided neutral. What are the possibilities? for the multiplication table. Well, we can already fill in most of the multiplication table, right? So, A being left neutral, what would it tell us? The first row is A and B. Okay, A being right neutral? The first column is A and B. Oh, by the way, I, I can mention this. You remember we proved that any left neutral element is equal to any right neutral element? Right? Mm -hmm. How do we prove it? We just multiply them with each other? You can also see that from the multiplication table because left neutral means that row repeats the top, the header row. Right neutral means that column repeats the he, the column of row headers. So if, if there's a left neutral and a right neutral element, then when you intersect that row and the column, that, that cell has to be equal to both the column header and the row header. Right? So the proof we did, you can think of it in terms of the multiplication table. Okay. Okay. So, so this, okay, so now coming back here, there's only one thing which we have some choice about, right? So what could you choose this to be? Well, there's, there's two, two possibilities. You could choose it to be A or what else could you choose it to be? Okay. Now, are, are both of these commutative? First one. No, both oh, are no, commutative. Both are Actually, like it doesn't matter what you put here, right? Because yeah, already you covered the diagonal, the yeah. off-diagonal ones, and that's actually only true because it has two elements. Mm -hmm. If it had more than two elements, then an existence of a neutral element wouldn't force commutative, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if it had three elements, then then you would just be having like a b c a b c, but you would still not know whether these two things commute, right? Yeah. But with two elements. There's very little space, so it, it's forced to be commutative. Okay, good. So it's both are commutative. Are they associative? Well, okay, so what do you need to check for associativity? So, okay, so for commutativity, we said we don't actually need to check anything because it's already covered, right? The same is true for associativity, actually. Now, remember, since A is neutral, any expression which has A anywhere in it will associate, right? Mm -hmm. Because once there's an A somewhere, you can just collapse that and you just get a product of the other two. So, the only things you really need to check are those which, which don't have any A's. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are the things which don't have any A's? B, B, B. So, the only thing you need to check for associativity is whether B star b star b equals b star b star b. Okay, this you actually need to check. So let's check it in both cases. So in the first case, b star b is a. Okay. And a star b is b. So you get b for this and you'll also get b for this, right? So b star b is a, whether you multiply by a on the left or the right, it's, it's Oh, but there's actually a shorter way of seeing that both are associative. So, we already said both are commutative, right? Mm -hmm. But if both are commutative, then that means that B and B star B have to commute. If B and B star B commute, then these two are equal. Yeah. Right? So, associativity between three things which are the same follows from commutativity is what I'm saying. Okay. You see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, both are associative. 
So this is the this is called the law of small. I mean, not not this specific thing, but this idea is called the law of small numbers. When you have very small things, you often get lots of results which are not true in general. Mm -hmm. Right. So what did we show? We said if you have a set with two elements and it has a neutral element, then the operation has to be commutative. The operation has to be associative. Neither of these is true in general. If you have more than two elements. Okay. Now. Okay, now what's what's the way of thinking about these? Can you think about these more concretely? What do you mean? Can you think about some other structures whose multiplication table looks the same if you relabel A? So I'll give you a hint. So so think about well, uh, think about these two sets subsets of reals under multiplication. So this is one of these, and this is the other one. You tell me which one is which. So zero one. Which of these looks the same as zero one? The first one. Under multiplication. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. So, so one is a. What if should you put b as zero or minus one? Is I'm asking. Like oh, minus one. So for this one is actually mm -hmm. this symbol means something, but minus one one, where one is a and minus one is. You see the multiplication table looks exactly the same. What about zero one? Does that look like this? Zero one. One is yeah. A and zero is B. With the usual real multiplication. Okay. And now you can see from because these are subsets of the real, so the usual multiplication, they're commutative and associative. That's another way of seeing it. Right, but you didn't actually have to know this thing. You could just directly see from the table. So these two are two groups. No, only one of them is a group. Which one is a group? The first one. The first one. The second one is not a group, right? Why? Actually, that was the next thing I'm coming. I was coming to, but you got you brought it up. So why is this a group, and why is this not a group? The second one doesn't have a. Yeah, have what? Neutral. No, it already. It's already no. proved is neutral. Yeah. Um, doesn't have what inverse. inverses, right? B doesn't have an inverse. How do you see? How do you? Yeah, we didn't talk about this. We didn't mention. But how do you check that something has an inverse? Well, once you've already found the identity element, right? Suppose I want to find the right inverse for B. Well, what do I do? I look in the row of B. I see where does the identity element appear. Mm -hmm. Then I see what column that was under, and that's the inverse element, right inverse. Okay. Similarly, if I want to find the left inverse, I look in the column for B. I'll see where does the identity element appear, and I'll see the row for that, and that's the uh, left inverse. Okay, so that's how you find inverses. And this one, you can see there aren't any inverses for B. Uh, but there's another thing you also see. You remember groups? You have cancellation. Yeah. What cancellation will actually tell you is that in any row, all the entries are different. So if you look at this row. All the entries in every row are different. Do you see that? Yeah. So let's write down a few more of these general things. So I'll just write inverses left and right can be located using the multiplication table. And what is the other thing we said? Cancellation. It means that all the row elements are yeah different. Well, depending on whether it's left or right. So left cancellator would mean all the elements in a given uh, row, row are different, and uh, right means in a given column. And and in a group, therefore, what do you know in a group? Everything's left and right cancellated, which means every row, all the elements are different. Every column, all the elements are different. Okay. So every row has essentially, and because it's a fine, if you are working with finite sets, then all the elements being different would mean that they cover everything in the group, right? Right. So like. All the all the each row is is just a permutation of the full set of the group. Each column is just a permutation of the full set of the group. So here you have A B B A A B B A, right? 
I'm ignoring the headers when I talk of the row and column. Here on the other hand, you have AB. This one's fine, but this one's not. Right? And this column's not. Okay. So, if I ask you find all the possible groups of order 2, well, what are the possible groups of order 2? Hmm? All the possible groups of with elements. With two elements, yes. For, what kind of elements? Well, um, just fix the elements A and B. And, and I really care about the groups up to what I'll later call isomorphism, but what I really mean is, I don't count two groups as different if I can just relabel the elements and get from one group to another. Right? So if I can just like change the labels. So I don't really think of this group as different from this group. Why? Because I could because it's just a change of labels, right? Anything I do in this group, I could just do it in this group by just changing the labels everywhere. Okay. So in that sense, how many what are the groups of order two? That is groups with two elements. Well, if it's a group, it has to have an identity element. Okay? Right? And we could just call the identity element A. I mean, it could have been B, but as I said, we don't care about the labels. Right? Okay. So, A has to be identity element. And we already wrote down all the, all the uh, magmas with A as the identity element. Right? These are the only two. And of these, this was the only group. So, this is essentially, it's the only group of order two. Okay, this is the only up to what I later call isomorphism. So this is the group of order two. Okay, great. Now there, there are actually smarter ways of finding all groups of a given order without having to construct multiplication tables, but that's that's for later.